My name is Neil Vandry. I'm your officiator this evening. I want to welcome you all here to the Church of Perpetual Life in celebration of James Bedford Day. And it's a thrill to be here. And I know that we have a number of people online. I want to welcome everyone online to the Church of Perpetual Life virtual church. People all over the world streaming in our presentation this evening. And I'd also like to point out our Perpetual Life Creed. If you'd like to read this with me, you're welcome to the Perpetual Life Creed. We believe that all of life is sacred and that we have been given this one life to make unlimited. We believe in our Creator's divine plan for all of humanity to have infinite lifespans in perfect health and eternal joy, rendering death to be optional. By following our gospel, we achieve eternal life, creating a heaven here on earth. We follow Nikolai Fedorov, who taught that the transcendence of the Creator will only be solved when humanity, in our unified efforts, become an instrument of universal resuscitation, when the divine word becomes our divine action. And we follow Arthur C. Clarke, who said, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so we enter each day energized in spirit and empowered by the words of our prophets to live in joy, serving our creator and all of mankind forever and ever. Yay. So here at the Church of Perpetual Life, we refer to ourselves as immortalists, not because we have defeated death today, but because we believe in future technology that will conquer diseases, the disease of aging, as well as death itself. While we fully understand that this technology does not appear to be currently available, the impressive history of humanity and human problem solving and technological advancement gives us faith in this inevitability. Today is a special day. T tomorrow it's actually the day, but we're celebrating today. This is the celebration of James Bedford Day. The city of Hollywood has announced and cre has uh, ordained that this is a holiday all throughout the city of Hollywood. So all throughout Hollywood, we are celebrating Bedford Day. And we're thankful for Ben Best for creating this celebration and for coming up with this idea. I'd like to also let you know about next our next regular service here at Perpetual Life, which will be Thursday evening, January 23rd, when we have Liz Parrish coming in for a special presentation. So don't miss that. Put it on your calendars. Mark that as important. On January 23rd, Thursday evening, Liz Parrish, for the first time, will be speaking here. And she's one of the greats in age reversal. Plan A for an immortalist here at Perpetual Life is to reverse aging and to live an unlimited life. But plan B is a type of life insurance, the idea of cryonic suspension. So you'll be hearing a lot about cryonic suspension this evening. I'd like to welcome you also to borrow a book from one of our books in the library in the back. We have Rudy's special book, The Affordable Immortal. And it's only the greatest book. Only the greatest book. Rudy drove like five or six, mi five or six hours to be here tonight. I'm so glad you're here, Rudy. And we're going to allow him to do a book signing. You have some books with you? We're going to set up a table for him downstairs to be able to do a book signing for his Affordable Immortal. I'm so glad you're here with that. And we have uh, the only, I, I think the, co the couple of copies we had in the library have been checked out, but you can buy his book downstairs at his signing. So this is a great opportunity for that. So uh, we're going to get right underway with our first film. We have a couple of films tonight. The first one is the longest one. It runs 25 or 30 minutes. And it will show you, it'll give you a brief glimpse into cryonics, and then we're going to have Ben come up and, and uh, speak on a couple of important things. So let's go ahead and run the film, gentlemen and lady, on the, the first film for this evening. We'll take down some of the roof, some of the room lights. From the beginning of time, this has been mankind's dream to explore the wonders of nature in all its magnificence. To experience the treasure of life with all its possibilities. To unravel the mysteries of time with all its promise. Mm. 
as the pace of life all around us quickens. Science is on the verge of making mankind's dream of having more time a reality. A dream of harnessing time, capturing time, expanding time. Enough time to explore, to discover, to understand, to experience a long and fruitful life. The ancient Egyptians believed that their spirit in the afterlife could eat, play, and enjoy all the things they had on earth. For 25 centuries, Tibetan monks harbored the secrets to remarkable rejuvenation in the Eye of Revelation. Polynesian tradition located their fountain of perpetual youth in Hawaii. More than 500 years ago, Ponce de Leon sought the fabled fountain of youth throughout the Americas. The promise of more time has fascinated man from the beginning, always beckoning. If we live 10 more years, that's good. If we live 20 more years, that's pretty good. 30 more years, oh, it's getting sketchy. 40, 50, okay. If you live 54 years, think of all the things that you could do within those 50 years. You could see your children graduating from college. You could see your children being married. And then you could see their children. You could see your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. More time for love. I want more time to have more of the same and all the things all the experiences, all the adventures, all the passions, all the intimacies, all the closenesses with family that I can't possibly get into a day, a week, a month, a year, a normal lifespan. More time to experience life to the fullest. Well, I want to enjoy life. I enjoy life now. I have no desire uh, to stop living. The family, the friends, and the quality of life uh, keeps uh, improving. Life becomes uh, a greater experience as we uh, grow older and uh, understand it better. More time to see what the future will bring. I would really love to get a chance to see the stars one day and, and maybe do some intergalactic travel instead of just uh, international travel. I think we have a tremendous instinct for survival. I think it was best stated, at least in printed word, the longest ago by Benjamin Franklin, who very clearly stated that he wished, instead of an ordinary death, to be placed in a cask of Madeira wine with some good friends to be revived by the warm sun of his country a hundred years hence. But he said, alas, I fear we are too close to the infancy of science to have that happen. Well, we're not 200 and some odd years later too close to the infancy. In fact, we are approaching uh, the nascency, uh, the nascence of this idea being very possible. So I think it's within human beings to want to know what might happen in the future. But it would be more than two centuries before science would catch up to Franklin's wish. In 1964, physics teacher Robert Edinger published The Prospect of Immortality, detailing the prospect of freezing a human until medical science advanced enough to restore the person to good health. Man's dream of suspending life was on the verge of reality, and it was called cryonics. Myself and a couple of others were involved with uh, cryogenics, uh, cryonic, cryogenics at the time, which is making uh, vehicles that store liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen, oxygen. And we had a uh, very uh, interesting experience uh, working with the NASA uh, S4B Saturn upper stage that took the, put the Apollo astronauts on the moon by doing a lot of cryogenic testing with, with vessels and valves and this sort of thing. From that data, from that knowledge, we figured we could produce about 1,000 cryo capsules a year. So we designed what we thought was the ultimate cryo capsule. It's super insulation, high vacuum, uh, access ports using the latest technology for sealing and with bellows for expansion and instrumentation. And we had it fabricated here in Phoenix. Just three short years after Edinger's book in January of 1967, Ted Craver and his colleagues got their chance to make history. About a year later is when we got the word from California that Dr. Bedford had died and uh, his, uh, his family wanted him frozen. And uh, it was brought in, oh, I think about late afternoon and we had the capsule ready and uh, we started the procedure. And we had, uh, it took until about three in the morning, three or four in the morning before we could finally uh, get Dr. Bedford, uh, we've been pre-frozen into the capsule, all the instrumentation hooked up, and all the um, 
uh, insulation put around the, the head of it and put the outer head on and then eventually start drawing a vacuum. And then we uh, uh, put the liquid nitrogen in and we could watch the temperature dropping very rapidly and it seemed to be pretty well frozen, deeply frozen by the, uh, by the next day. This new avenue of scientific exploration called cryonics not only captured the imagination of scientific men like Ted Craver, but of Hollywood as well. So while the science of cryonics was still a neophyte, the movies were already giving us visions of what could be ahead. Could science really discover the way to suspend time? You will be placed in cryostasis for the duration of your sentence. Could we travel hundreds of light years away to the edge of the galaxy and awaken when we arrived? Even before Edinger's vision in the 1960s, science and technology were already extending our lifespans. Since Henry Ford introduced his first Model T, the average American lifespan has increased by 50%. In the early 1900s, no one dreamed of a cure for polio, let alone life-extending heart transplants, life-giving in vitro fertilization, or life-changing stem cell research. And with each new scientific and medical advancement, we understand more about the true nature of our biology, the subtleties between life and death. What was considered dead 50 years ago is no longer valid today. CPR and defibrillators revive thousands of legally dead people each year effortlessly. Organ transplants and open heart surgery are routine and highly successful at bringing new life to the otherwise terminally ill patient. And we know from the miraculous stories of children who have been brought back to life after drowning in icy lakes or rivers that cold staved off death. Well, people are beginning to reassess what they mean by death, and it's, it's long, this has long been overdue because we've known that you can preserve cells and even organisms like tardigrade, a little water bear animal, for a hundred years without any metabolism at all. So we know that metabolism, the machinery of life, doesn't have to be active for life to be there in some kind of form. So our usual definition of life, which is the metabolic processes and the chemistry and all those things, that's not really life. Life is the information with the ability to store cells in liquid nitrogen for as long as you want, which we do routinely now, and embryos, human embryos as well, um, we should be thinking about the fact that life is, is the information and that it is potentially as permanent as you'd like it to be. So if death is not simply the moment when our heart stops, then when does it occur? We have this legal concept called clinical death, where one is pronounced dead, but there's no actual uh, black and white biological change that happens simultaneously with going from a state of being um, clinically dead, clinically dead, clinically dead, or that really matters if your heart has stopped. And it's some time from then before um, things start going really wrong, especially if you get cooled down really quickly as soon as your heart has stopped. Um, so. Restoring someone who's been well cryopreserved to a uh, functional state, a biologically functional state, is simply a natural extension of restoring someone who is still alive but very frail and suffering advanced aspects of aging, whether it's cancer or atherosclerosis or whatever, again, then to a youthful state. It's not even just theoretically possible in the same way that um, traveling at half the speed of light is theoretically possible. It's a perfectly reasonable natural extension of straightforward biotechnology. Cryonics is the next logical step for significantly extending life. I think cryonics is going to one day possibly provide that ultimate dream come true. It will radically transform society. The way we think about life and death today will be obsolete. I think we're going to have to develop a whole new paradigm on what uh, life is, what death is, and what constitutes an acceptable lifespan. Or even if there is such a thing as a acceptable lifespan, or is an unlimited lifespan going to become the norm? 
Optimally, cryonics captures biological life at the moment medical science pronounces death, but before the biological functions begin to deteriorate. Death is not an event. It is a process. And at the moment of legal pronouncement, you are still very much biologically alive. And if we can uh, access your body at the time of pronouncement and put you into biostasis immediately, then we have essentially stopped your biological clock and we're able to preserve you in that biologically viable state for an indefinite period of time. At which point, at some point in time in the future, uh, it may be possible to uh, revive you from biostasis and cure whatever um, it was, disease, uh, uh, physical uh, trauma that caused your death and restore you to good health. This is the world's leader in cryonics and cryonics research and technology, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona. Alcor was founded in 1972 in Fulton, California for the purposes of cryonic suspension. Uh, after a number of years, uh, we relocated our facility from Fulton to Riverside, California. And after about 10 years in that location, because we outgrew it and because of the uh, concern that we had uh, with earthquakes, uh, we decided to relocate to Scottsdale, Arizona. From its quiet beginnings in the 70s, today Alcor has over 700 members around the globe including world-renowned scientists, physicians, scholars, and business leaders. In this state-of-the-art operating room in Scottsdale, Arizona, the intricate work of cryonics is routinely performed. The science of cryonics is a series of meticulous and exacting procedures to ensure that the patient has the best possible chance to be revitalized in the future. There are three basic steps. First, the stabilization. Next, the introduction of cryoprotectants. And the third step is the final cool down to sub-zero temperatures. Under ideal circumstances, it starts within an instant of a physician pronouncing legal death. We deploy a team of specially trained technicians, uh, some paramedics, some EMTs, some cryonicists, and they take a kit that has stabilization equipment, quite extensive stabilization equipment. Uh, this equipment includes a series of medications that are injected after pronouncement. In the first part of the procedure when the person just after their heart has stopped, um, the, the main problem is trying to get them cold as fast as possible. And uh, the idea is to remove as much of the temperature as much of the heat as you can and cool them as rapidly as possible because the damage that happens is a function of temperature. So uh, if you go all the way down to the temperature of ice, the damage is happening only one eighteenth as fast as at normal body temperature. And at that point, we perform a blood washout. We wash out their blood and replace it with an organ preservation solution. Specially developed solutions called cryoprotectants are carefully infused. Now, cryoprotection is the step of the procedure that is probably the most critical. It is the one that prepares the tissues for the lower temperatures and reduces the damage that occurs when you freeze tissue. Right now, taking tissue down to, to minus 196 degrees Celsius causes all tissue to freeze. There is damage. And the purpose of the cryoprotection is to reduce the damage to a minimal form. The final and longest step is a carefully controlled and monitored cool down. We cool the patient under controlled circumstances at the rate of one degree Celsius per hour all the way down to liquid nitrogen. And during this time, there's, there's no observation that can be done directly of the individual because the temperature changes, they're very sensitive to temperature changes. So we do have computer monitoring of the whole system as well as control of the cooling curve itself. So once they're cooled and they're minus 196, uh, it's a simple matter of transferring them to a long-term storage stewer, a container, very similar to a giant thermos bottle. Uh, basically, it requires no electricity, uh, no support of any kind aside from the occasional topping up with liquid nitrogen. 
And once there, we've got time. We've got time because a person can be maintained at that temperature with virtually no degradation of the tissue indefinitely. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, nearly 70 patients are carefully maintained in the Alcor patient care bay, waiting for science and technology to find the solutions that will restore them to good health. The science and technology of extending life tomorrow is happening today. Our scientific goals are to achieve re reversible suspended animation, uh, to be able to, to place our patients into biostasis without cellular disruption, and to be able to bring our patients down to a temperature that is sufficient to preserve them for a extended period of time without causing damage to them through the cryopreservation process itself. In Southern California, 21st century medicine is breaking new ground in the world of cryobiology. The 21st century medicine, we do research on low temperature preservation of tissues and organs for medical applications, especially transplantation and pharmaceutical research. We currently have federally funded projects for preservation of kidneys, hearts, corneas, and also do research on preservation of tissue slices for pharmaceutical research. Here, their work focuses on the full circle of preserving organs in deep coal and then recovering them with minimal damage. When we prepare an organ for cryopreservation, we begin by perfusing it with a solution that closely resembles the liquid part of blood. And then we begin slowly increasing the concentration of cryoprotectants over a period of a couple of hours. And then at that time, the, the organ is ready for deep cooling. We then cool the organ as rapidly as we can, uh, and we cool to a temperature of approximately minus 130 degrees C, ideally. And then we can store for as long as we want at that temperature. Uh, we would then um, carefully rewarm it and uh, connect it back up to an organ perfusion machine that then, in a careful, gradual process, uh, unloads the cryoprotectants over a period of several hours, at which point it will be ready to be transplanted. The implications of this work are far-reaching. Each year, more than 16,000 people die because they need an organ transplant, and there is none available. My goal is to have us be very successful at preserving organs by conventional methods and by cryopreservation. And I believe that the outcome of this will be that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients will benefit and may even survive as a result of the efforts that we're doing here at, in this company. Well, right now, as everyone knows, we're faced in the United States with a uh, rapidly aging population that is going to have tremendous medical needs in coming decades. And a lot of those needs can be addressed by transplantation and tissue replacement, uh, especially of bioengineered tissues. And uh, the ability to uh, inventory those tissues using uh, good preservation methods will be vital to treating uh, an aging population. Of paramount importance to the success of cryobiology is the ability to cool to super low temperatures without damage to cells. Normal freezing causes water to damage surrounding cells. This has a devastating effect since our bodies are 60% water. Enter a process called vitrification. Vitrification is a process where we replace uh, so much water inside cells and tissues with agents called cryoprotectants that we can cool the tissue or organs to a very low temperature, even as cold as liquid nitrogen, without forming any ice inside them. And in this process, once we become colder than about minus 120 degrees Celsius, the tissue becomes essentially solid like a glass. This photograph shows two rabbit kidneys at a temperature of minus 140 degrees Celsius. The kidney on the left was frozen and it's essentially turned into a, uh, an ice ball, severely damaged by ice, whereas the kidney on the right was protected by chemicals that caused it to vitrify rather than freeze. And it shows no signs of ice damage whatsoever. 
As research gets closer and closer to perfecting cryoprotectants, the odds of successfully reversing the process get better. Until that time, what about damage that results from imperfect methods, especially for those who were cryopreserved before the advent of today's new cryoprotectants? Disease and ill health are caused largely by damage at the molecular and the cellular level. Today's surgical tools are simply too big to deal with that kind of damage. In the future, with nanotechnology, we'll have medical tools and medical instruments that are molecular in their size and in their precision. And these tools will be able to deal directly with the fundamental causes of damage and ill health. We'll be able to cure and heal in cases that today would be considered hopeless. Nanotechnology is the revolutionary concept of molecular-sized machines. Machines so tiny they could be introduced into a person. From the imaginations of artists around the world, we are able to see how nanorobots and nanomachines yet to be developed could solve any number of problems. From repairing aging cells to hunting down cancer. So if you had medical nano devices small enough that they could literally circulate through the body and literally enter individual cells, these small devices with small onboard computers could check for several different conditions. They could check the concentration of several different chemicals in the red blood cell. They could check the location. Obviously, if you're looking at liver cancer, you don't have to worry about tissue that's in your big toe. So location information could be used, chemical concentration information could be used so that the medical nano device would be able to identify the cell as either normal or cancerous. And if it was cancerous, then it could go ahead and use a variety of techniques to remove that cell, to eliminate that cell from the body. At prestigious research facilities like Stanford, Caltech, and MIT, advances in medical nanotechnology are being made. With each new advancement, the ability to revitalize patients in cryonic suspension moves one step closer to reality. Everyone always wants to know how long it will be before these technologies are available. And the correct scientific answer is, I don't know. Having said that, though, I can look at the trends in computer hardware, where every year we are building smaller, more precise, finer structures. And if you extrapolate those trend lines out, you find that within a few decades, we'll have to develop some sort of nanotechnology to keep the computer hardware revolution on track. And the technologies we develop that will let us build these molecular structures for electronic and computer devices should be applicable to let us build a whole range of other molecular structures. So, I think a few decades in order to have the molecular machines, the molecular devices that we'll be using in nanomedicine. The promise of cryonics, vitrification, and nanotechnology is enormous. But these leading edge sciences and technologies are not without their challenges, including sorting scientific facts from popular and wide held fiction. The challenge is, is having the public understand the long-term implications and benefits to humankind of cryogenics, vitrification, and cryopreservation. Uh, right now, I think they get that Hollywood view of Ricardo Montalban in Star Trek coming out of a glass encased uh, facility, uh, fully clothed, having been preserved for 200 years, and he starts walking and talking, or worse. They look at Austin Powers coming out of a vitrification or cryogenic preservation, and, and of course that's, that's probably the worst side of it. But, but the fact of the matter is we need to explain to them and educate to them the long-term value of the scientific study of cryogenics, nanotechnology, and vitrification, and the other related sciences, and what it can mean long-term to humankind. In any discussion of death and dying, the questions of God and religion often arise. Uh, I think the biggest myth about cryonics is that we're trying to play God, that we are tampering with the natural forces of life. Um, no, we're not trying to play God, and many of us have a belief in a supreme being. Um, that second part of it is a little more intriguing, that we're 
uh, we're tampering with nature. Of course we are. That's what science does. It attempts to overcome those forces of nature that have been detrimental to the human species. Um, and we're proud of that. But are we playing God? Do we choose who shall live and who shall die? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the philosophical questions abound. At each juncture of exponential advancement in science and technology, each time we push forward the boundaries of man's reach, it is inevitable that we take a good, hard look at what it means. This is radically new. This is radically different from what people have practiced for thousands of years. There is a lot of apprehension about where we're going with this technology, just like there's a lot of apprehension about where scientists are going with stem cell research, uh, with therapeutic cloning, uh, with cellular regeneration. These are all emerging sciences that are not going to stop just because it makes people queasy. Uh, these things are going to happen. And we need, as a society, to embrace these technologies. It is in our nature to explore, to seek, to question, both scientifically and philosophically. And we will continue to question, to challenge the thresholds of science, to dream of tomorrow. You know, I lost my mother when I was 20, and she was 49. And I have to tell you, there's so many parts of my life that she didn't get to experience. I want to experience all of those times with my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And I don't know what's going to happen to me. You never know. My mother was a healthy person, and then one day she was sick and she was gone. And that could happen to me. I would love the opportunity to suspend my life, to not suffer through illness and pain, and then to be reanimated at a time when I could be a healthy person again and live a healthy life. To dream of the unknown, unbounded, limitless. I think that's a great preview of cryonics, what it is, huh? Beautiful video. Thanks for sharing that with us, Ben, for letting us uh, know of this so that we could have this this evening. Appreciate that. We now have the honor of bringing up. Yes, we're going to do that after your. More than three yes. more. Yes. All right. Okay. But I'll give you an introduction, if I may. Okay. So we have the gentleman with us who is the treasurer and has been the treasurer on the for the Church of Perpetual Life since our inception. Ben was the president and CEO of the Cryonics Institute, which is one of the world's largest cryonics organizations for nine years. Ben is a well-known activist in cryonics and life extension advocacy. He holds undergraduate degrees in pharmacy from the University of British Columbia and physics and computing science and finance from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Ben is also certified as a professional registered parliamentarian by the National Association of Parliamentarians. And we want to welcome him up here tonight, Mr. Ben Best. Ben. I'd like to also welcome those who have come in from Australia, Europe, and Canada who are streaming in, live streaming right now. Ben, it's yours. Okay, Bedford Day is tomorrow, and we're celebrating it today. And uh, there he is, James Bedford, and um, he's been in liquidation for 53 years now. And uh, it says, the first man cryonically preserved. We'll qualify that. In, I, it's not the first person cryonically preserved. We'll get to that. So he was preserved in January 12, 1967. He wrote to Robert Edinger, the, the man who started cryonics movement, in June 1966, saying he was dying of liver cancer and it spread to his lungs. And he was preserved at the age of 73 um, on January 12th, 67. He was in dry ice for six days and then transferred to liquid nitrogen. And uh, as we saw in the previous video, it was, uh, it was um, by a company building uh, uh, cryo capsules. And we'll discuss that a little later. And he's currently being stored by Alcor Life Extension 
foundation, the, the company that made the previous film. So there he is. He was a psychology professor with a PhD. Um, he um, <clears throat> wrote uh, seven books on vocational training. He liked to travel, went to Africa and, and uh, the Amazon and Alaska Highway, Europe and so forth. And uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't sure that he really wanted to do this. He didn't think he was worth preserving. And, but uh, Dr. Edinger persuaded him, or Robert Edinger persuaded him to, that uh, it would benefit not only himself, his family and friends. So I guess uh, some of us uh, want to live a long time. Uh, Bedford uh, did it not just for himself, but for others. Um, anyway, this, here was the team that, uh, that preserved him. And there was Robert Nelson, who founded the Chronic Society of California. Uh, and he's, been, he's seen in the background of that picture. And then uh, Dante Bruno, research physician and biophysicist, who's in the foreground. And uh, Dr. A the Bedford personal physician, Dr. Abel, and uh, uh, a hospice and nursing couple team, and Robert Prihoda, a chemist, uh, who wrote a book called Suspended Animation. So um, he was in a nursing home when his, when his uh, condition deteriorated and he summoned his physician. And he was expected to live another two weeks, but uh, the physician arrived just before Bedford died and uh, was able to promptly pronounce death. So this is ideal in cryonic circumstances when you can actually get a, uh, have a physician on hand to, or somebody, a nurse or somebody, to pronounce death uh, as soon as it happens and they're able to start the process immediately. And uh, so they dumped ice on Dr. Bedford and, uh, and uh, administered chest compressions and so forth. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> after two hours, uh, doctor, uh, the, the, other, uh, the other people were summoned to, uh, to do the perfusion. So the idea of perfusion, is, as we saw in the film, is to replace the, uh, the blood uh, and the water, body water, with uh, something that's going to prevent uh, antifreeze. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, they were using DMSO and Ringer solution, uh, but the perfusion apparatus wasn't ready, so they just injected uh, 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 near the carotid arteries uh, this uh, DMSO, so it wasn't an ideal, ideal situation. But because of the bleeding, uh, there must have been some blood replacement with the antifreeze solution. Anyway, he was in dry ice for six days before being transferred to liquid nitrogen. Uh, and he was maintained uh, there by his family until being transferred to Alcor in uh, 1982, uh, where he still is, remains. And uh, examination of his body in 1991 indicated there had been no rewarming above cryogenic temperatures in the 24 years uh, that, uh, between uh, when he got to Alcor. And, uh, <clears throat> Actually, Life magazine was going to f uh, feature this uh, chronic preservation, and they had a six-page story about it for the February 3rd, 1967 issue. But uh, because of a, 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 a space, uh, a, a Apollo astronaut disaster, the, the uh, Cape Kennedy, the, the um, astronaut, the, anyway, the, the, there was a cabin fire and uh, the, the killed three uh, Apollo astronauts, and that, that, was, uh, that replaced uh, this particular issue of uh, Life magazine. So as I mentioned, he was maintained by his family, uh, not by Robert Nelson or, or the Chronic Society. Robert Nelson's organization, the Chronic Society of California, was not used. The family didn't trust Nelson. They had questions about it. Nelson only had charge of, uh, of a bed for, for about uh, six days while he was in dry ice. And um, all of the other Chronic Society of California patients uh, perished. By um, 1979, all, they'd all been thawed or buried. And uh, it it's re really was a, a, a great disaster for the beginning of cryonics, called the Chatsworth, Cal Chatsworth California disaster. It was in Chatsworth, California. And uh, could have been as damaging to cryonics as space shuttle explosion was to space exploration. So here's uh, all these people. All these people were cryopreserved uh, and cry chronically preserved up to 1973, and uh, as well as two others not shown. Bedford is the only one still in liquidation. 
all these other people perished. So what happened to all these people? Um, now you might notice, uh, on, if you look carefully here, uh, these are in uh, chronological order of the dates they were preserved. And um, Bedford was number two here, January 1967. And Sarah Gilbert was April 1966. So this was a woman. That's why we call James Bedford the first man chronically preserved, because there was actually a woman chronically preserved before James Bedford. But uh, James Bedford, as I say, is the only one still in liquidation of everyone shown here. So uh, we saw in the video um, Ted Craver uh, was working for Cryocare Equipment Corporation. Now their intention was only to, to manufacture. They, there was a belief at that time that Cryonix was going to be this booming industry. And so they, the crowd care equipment was going to be on the, getting on the ground floor making uh, these capsules for uh, Cryonix patients. And they were going to sell them to Cryonix companies. But uh, there weren't really Cryonix companies existing at that time uh, other than the Cryonix Society of California, which didn't have any patients. And uh, crowd care this, uh, was con contacted by this, the son of this uh, Sarah Gilbert and uh, she'd been embalmed and kept in a freezer for two months, but the son wanted her mother, uh, wanted his mother chronically preserved. And so uh, crowd care, uh, even though they were just making capsules, they, they went ahead and uh, they wanted to show that their capsules worked, so they put her in liquid nitrogen in 1966, April. And the son covered all the expenses, but the other relatives didn't like the idea, they complained. and. Uh, after several months, uh, Sarah was buried, and that was the end of that. So, uh, at Cryocare, uh, despite the fact that they were only intending to manufacture capsules, uh, they, they accepted three more cryonics patients over the next two years. Uh, but uh, they were really, uh, they weren't cryonicists, they were, they were trying to make money by making these capsules, and it became clear to them that they weren't, and preserving the patients weren't working, weren't... Uh, um, wasn't making money for them either. So uh, two of the patients were buried by relatives and the third patient was sent to the Cryonic Society of California. So this was Robert Nesson's or organization uh, and uh, he accepted Cryonic's patients. Uh, either, uh, some of them didn't even pay at all. He just took them as charity because he thought Cryonic was gonna grow massively and, and he could cover, he could afford to accept charity patients. Or the others will pay as you go. In other words, pay as you go, meaning that relatives of the patient paid for the patient to be stored in liquid nitrogen uh, on a regular basis, and, and, that, and that was the end of the payment process. And uh, in many cases, uh, you know, after after uh, several months or years, uh, a lot of a lot of the families uh, you know, might have fi financial difficulties, or or maybe a new new car was more important than keeping up the liquid nitrogen payments for Uncle Ralph. And so uh, uh, they just stopped paying. And uh, so Nelson, Nelson's policy was to still to, to try to hope, try to keep them all in liquid nitrogen. He didn't want to take anybody out of liquid nitrogen. And, uh, but he, he couldn't afford it. He, he, they, he just couldn't afford the night liquid nitrogen. He let the, all the patients fall, tried to cover it up for a while. Uh, but uh, it was, he was revealed in the end and he was sued. And uh, as I say, this was equivalent of, this, this disaster uh, was equivalent of the, of, uh, of the space shuttle explosion. It was very damaging uh, to, to cryonics to, to be starting this way. Now the Cryonic Society in New York was also preserving uh, patients and that they began, they had their first patient in July 1968. Uh, now they had a different policy. They, had, they also had a pay-as-you-go policy, but uh, if, if the payments, if the, if the uh, relatives of the patient uh, stopped paying, uh, they would just uh, take the patient out of liquid nitrogen and return them. So they were more financially responsible even though they were, they were uh, uh, letting the patients die, but they weren't, you know, their first priority was to remain financially solvent, not, not, uh, not uh, preserve the patients at any cost. So a lot of these patients were buried. But in 1964, the, uh, um, 
the Cranks Society of New York was told by the New York Department of Health to close the Cranks facility and we'd find $1,000 a day. So that was a lot of money in 1974 also. And in any case, uh, uh, it was clear that the Cranks Society of New York could not, could not con function under these circumstances with the Department of Health against them and, and fines for not complying. So all these patients were returned to their relatives. Uh, ma'am, ma can I ask a quick question while you're in the presentation? Or yeah, not? go ahead. Do we know what the uh, rationale was for the Department of Public Health? Was it considered a health risk? Apparently. I, I can't read their minds or retrospectively. No, I, 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 I don't know what, the, what their problem was. Maybe they thought, I don't know, they were just crazy, I guess. <laughs> I don't see a health risk in maintaining people in liquid nitrogen. I don't see how that can be a risk, a health risk. Thank you. But uh, you never know. Bureaucrats have their own logic. Um, anyway, that currently uh, we've, we've, we've had, for the most part, we've, we've got um, 400, 400 patients uh, that have been, been maintained in liquid nitrogen for uh, 40 years. Uh, uh, we're at 400 worldwide, uh, uh, and uh, and um, there's no the, what <clears throat> there's better policies now to prevent the the disasters that happened with the Crank Society of New York and and the Crank Society of California. There's no pay-as-you-go policy anymore. Uh, the current patients must be funded in full before they're acquired preserved. In other words, uh, all the money necessary, and then the that maintaining the liquid nitrogen is not by getting relatives to pay. Maintaining the liquid nitrogen is because there's enough capital available that the interest or dividends or whatever from the capital that's put up is enough to maintain the liquid nitrogen. So that's an important policy, which is why these uh, 400 people are still in liquid nitrogen. And also they make cryonics organizations the legal owner of the bodies. In other words, the relatives don't have control of the patients anymore. The, the, the relatives don't, the patients don't belong to the relatives. The, rel, the patients belong to the cryonics organization. So those are, those are pretty strong policies. And uh, so, the, so the cryonics organizations know that they have the legal authority to, to keep, hold on to these patients. So that's why we've had 400 uh, maintained liquid nitrogen for uh, uh, or more than 400 for the last 40 years. However, there's been two exceptions in those 40 years, which I mentioned. Uh, just the, time, Trans Time was this organization, still had a pay-as-you-go policy even in 1983. Uh, so, and, and it was another case of the relatives deciding not to, not to uh, keep paying. And so this guy, Sam Berkowitz, was, uh, ended up being, bait, so, being buried. So even, even Trans Time now does no, no longer has a pay-as-you-go policy. Now, in 1994, there was an Alcor patient. Uh, uh, her, her husband had, had, had arranged the prior preservation, uh, but uh, later there was this last will and testament discovered by her sister or, and indicating that this woman wanted a Christian burial. And uh, this went to court. Alcor tried to fight it in court, but uh, the, the courts ruled in favor of you know, since uh, Sylvia had not made the arrangements herself, her husband had made the arrangements, and, and uh, this, uh, this will indicated she wanted a Christian burial, uh, the, the, the court uh, ruled against Alcor. So that was one, one, one patient uh, lost, uh, which wasn't pay as you go uh, in the last 40 years. But uh, there's a lot of new court uh, organizations being planned or uh, uh, there's uh, Creek Cryo, this uh, Valencia, Spain, which doesn't have any patients. Uh, European Biostasis Foundation, Switzerland, Southern Cryonics, Australia. Cryo Russ is now splitting in two, becoming two organizations. And uh, I guess we have, a, we have a, an organization here in South Florida, in, in Miami. And uh, all these uh, new organizations being planned and spawned, and, and we don't know what their policies are. And, and I think, uh, unfortunately, there, there could be more disasters and, uh, or patients brought out, and I think it's, it's going to be a very bad sign for cryonics if that happens. Anyway, we worry about it and hope it doesn't happen. 
So anyway, uh, there's not a large audience here, but I still would like to have a, a poll, uh, if I can, uh, have a raise of hands. One, yeah, I think that's helpful. Who has no interest in making cryonics arrangements? Will you raise your hand if you have absolutely no interest? Okay, there's just one. Okay. Uh, who, who would make cryonics arrangements if it was affordable? <laughs> a few others. And... Uh, so what, other than finances, would, uh, would, you, would, well, uh, would you make cryonics arrangements if they weren't for other problems? And we won't specify what those problems are. So I don't see any hands going up. And uh, so what are, uh, who's signed up for cryonics but uh, not desiring to participate other than as a consumer? Nobody, nobody's in that category? And what if you sign up for cryonics, but you do want to participate in, in uh, helping the, the cryonics preservation process? Okay. And um, what if you're not signed up, but you want to participate anyway? Any hands? No hands. Well, okay. Um, anyway, if you're um, wanting to participate, uh, um, let us know and, uh, and we'll see if we can help. And also, if you have financial questions, you can talk to Doc, Mr. Uh, uh, Rudy Hoffman here. And uh, he's got a lot of insight in how to arrange financing. So, any questions? How did you obtain all this information? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it was all published. Public. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, uh, <laughs> as these events, events transpired, they were, they were recorded, uh, you know, uh, the, the case of, uh, the case of uh, you know, the, it, it, everything gets documented, the Cryonics <coughs> Magazine has been, and the uh, Immortalist and these other publications have been covering Cryonics events uh, for decades, and uh, as these events transpire, they get recorded. Uh, and uh, you know certainly uh, uh, the Chatsworth uh, the Chatsworth issue was a you know major disaster, and there's a lot of documentation about that. A lot of but court you had to research it all and then compile it into the presentation. Or? Well, as far as uh, I'm just saying, I, yeah, I, I, I looked through looked through uh, various uh, uh, various articles in Cryonics magazine and other other journals and so forth, and dug up all this. Uh, History, and uh, I have to I have to thank uh, Mike Perry is is the is the uh, uh, actually the the big uh, um, he, he works at Alcor he's he's the probably the most knowledgeable of cryonics history of anybody and and uh, um, I use a lot of his articles and uh, I actually had a phone co conversation with him today just to clarify a few points. Yeah, Mike's a great guy. He's been here to the ch church a few times. Um, because we're online, Ben, I'd like to have the questions using this microphone so people online can hear the questions. Rudy. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my uh, question is more in the line of an observation. Uh, first of all, Ben, I want to thank you for the amazing amount of contributions you have made to cryonics as well as life extension over literally decades. A lot of folks don't realize that uh, Ben Best has literally been the history-making individual, and he basically... Uh, ran the Cryonics Institute for nine years and has contributed a lot. And the, 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 I thought your question about how do you know what you know, how do you know this information is correct, was very helpful because it is important that we determine stuff based on reality, not on bad information. And uh, your observation, Ben, is that this is actually not just published, but it's even legal records that go back decades I do think it's also important for us to realize the fact that Ben is pointing out some major problems that Cryonics has had in the past. That actually is instructive to us and means that our current level of what we understand it takes to put a Cryonics organization together and keep people in biostasis indefinitely is now informed by decades of financial and legal information. So we are much more secure now than we have been. So it's important not to look, not to look, at, to look at these negatives, not as, oh, there's no way the cryonics will work because things go wrong, 
But yes, things can go wrong. We've learned how they can go wrong. Now we can fix them. So that's an important observation, if I may add that. Thanks again, Ben. Excellent. Any other questions for Ben? Over here, Kathy. And that was Rudy that was just talking, and he's one of the foremost life insurance agents for people who'd like to sign up for cryonics. Kathy. I would like to know who's watching the store, so to speak, if anyone has inspected the bodies to make sure that there's been no further degeneration or whatever. Well, as I said, uh, they did uh, inspect the body of uh, Robert Bedford and uh, found uh, no, no, uh, no, uh, um, <clears throat> no, no, uh, uh, no thawing over over the period in which he was preserved. Now they don't pull they don't pull patients out of liquidation all the time to to uh, to, to examine them. Uh, they, once they put in, they they pretty well stay in the liquid nitrogen. So uh, mainly, what they do is there are daily inspections, uh, or w daily or, or every few days of, of the levels of liquid nitrogen to maintain their, that they're preserved. Uh, the the, uh, the the cryonics organizations uh, are governed by people who themselves have cryonic, made cryonics arrangements and whose uh, whose uh, Loved ones, relatives, and loved ones are are preserved, and uh, so the the governance of these organizations it, it's not like cryocare. The, the the organization that was making cryo capsules is a profit making industry, so they weren't making a profit, so they just closed down operation. Uh, so it, it's not like that. Uh, it's it's more a matter of um, uh, of people running these organizations who are committed to the process themselves, you know, who want the process for themselves. Like myself, I was president of the Cryonics Institute. I'm signed up for Cryonics. I want it to work. I certainly don't want anybody, uh, anything to screw up the process if, it's, if I want it to work for me. May, investigation of what? Right. Well, at liquid nitrogen temperature, uh, well, molecular motion is essentially stopped. So uh, that's why that's why they can uh, uh, a proof of principle is is the fact that they can uh, they can uh, take a take a rabbit kidney and uh, and cool it down to minus 135 degrees Celsius cryogenic temperature and then warm it back up and transplant it into a, into a rabbit and the rabbit, uh, the rabbit uh, is able to live based on that this is a functioning kidney. So that now this, this doesn't prove that cryonics is going to work, but, but uh, you know, no, 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 <coughs> rabbit kidneys have been taken down, rabbit kidneys have been taken, anyway, it doesn't prove, it doesn't prove it's going to work. Uh, it's dependent on at, the, at present, cryonics is dependent on future technology. We can't bring cryonics patients back today. Thank you. But, but we're, we're getting, if there's no molecular motion, essentially nothing is happening. There's being no change in the state of the patient. Well, it's interesting what you said about the, the kidney. Just for example, has, you know, I assume that that was done relatively quickly. So has anybody put a rabbit kidney away for 10 years and then tried to implant well, it? it? But the thing is, uh, at cryogenic temperatures, there's nothing is happening for hundreds of thousands of years. You know, at, at, at those temperatures, there's just no molecular motion. There's no change. So uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they, sure, they, they, they took it down to cryogenic temperatures and then brought it back up again and, and transplanted it into a kidney. But it, the point is that they, they could have, you know, because the, the rabbit was still there. They wanted to transplant it back into the rabbit. You know, it needed a kidney. and, and uh, and they wanted to, to prove, the, prove the process. But the, the, the fact is, having cooled it down, it could have stayed at that temperature for, for you know, hundreds of thousands of years uh, with, without any change. So, uh, but, but, you know, they can't wait around hundreds of thousands of years, and it wouldn't make any difference anyway, because they, the rabbit needed a kidney, and, and they wanted to prove that it would work. Here's a question, Jeff. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> let's say... Theoretically, you know, somebody's cryogenically frozen, they wake up, or 100 years from now, the 
the cryonics company owns the body. Like, what's the purpose of that? Like, um, the purpose of that, as far as owning the body, the purpose of that is to is to make sure their relatives or other agents aren't interfering with the preservation of the body. Oh, I got it. right. Okay. I but, mean the the. the okay. Fact, yeah. Let's say 200 years from now, someone is, could be reanimated. <clears throat> uh, their relatives are gone. Maybe they have a couple of great grandchildren around. Probably forget even who they are, and they're sitting there now. Who who is going to initiate the process for? Well, the point is uh, the 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 chronic companies have a mandate to bring their patients back the, because the patients made these contracts with the with the chronic organization to be brought back when the technology was available. Uh, and okay. so it's, the, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, you, when you go to a hospital and you get surgery done on you, the, the surgeon uh, does his job because, you know, he's getting paid for one thing and he has a professional obligation to, to, uh, to do the surgery. It's the same, same thing. The Could be very expensive. The organization has a professional obligation to bring you back uh, if you've made an agreement with them to uh, bring you back. Would they have the funds to do that? What? Would they have the funds to do that? It must be an Well, that's an issue, but I, I, think, I think they would. Personally, the, mm -hmm. some, there's a little bit of dis disagreement about that, but okay. in, in my opinion, the, 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 funds, the funds are already there, but there's, there's no pay as you go, as I said I before. Yeah. The, the, there's funds, uh, and, and funds sufficient to, to maintain the person liquid nitrogen out of interest or, or dividends or whatever, however it's invested. And uh, okay. or you know, and and those funds, those those same funds could be used to reanimate the patient when the time comes for reanimation. Now uh, it may be very expensive at first. I mean, the human genome cost billions of dollars to do the first human genome, and now it's down to you know a, a thousand uh, even it, by some companies. So mm -hmm. as technology pro progresses. The cost of things go down. The same thing for okay. cell phones and and uh, and all. You know, all right. prices okay. drop as yeah. technology advances. Okay, thank you. Currently, the way most people fund their chronic suspension is with life insurance policies. People will go to a life insurance agent and write that policy to cover their chronic suspension, and that makes it affordable for anybody. Kathy, well, you brought up an interesting point. I'm not an attorney, but if the cryogenic corporation owns the body when the body's reanimated is it an individual or is it a slave or is it a thing that's owned or what <coughs> well uh, these 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 legal issues haven't been been uh, been uh, defined because because this this is a technology that, that, that the, the current legal system hasn't been aware of and uh, I, I wouldn't think they'd be a slave, though, because uh, a living person, we just don't have slavery for living people. We, we have ownership, we can have ownership of a body, but, but, I don't, but there's no ownership of a living person. Some members of Cryonics, uh, people who are going to be put into chronic suspension, are making financial arrangements for a future so that when they do come out of chronic suspension, they have a, a certain amount of wealth that they can than use, and uh, that can also be potentially used for their... Well, yeah, other, other people who, who don't believe my, my assessment of the cost, the, cost the, 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 the amount of money set aside to maintain the patient can be used to reanimate the patient. There's some people who question that. So as Neil is pointing out, there's people who set further money aside uh, in trusts and, uh, and so forth to, to make sure that there is enough money. Uh, but I think I, I, I think the money that to, to preserve the patient uh, it would be sufficient to reanimate uh, as it, it eventually as the costs of reanimation drop. And uh, okay, anyway, yeah. Rudy, here you go. Thank you, uh, Ben. What would you say the most significant challenge to cryonics is uh, today, currently? Well, um, <clears throat> I guess there's all, all these organizations and, and the fact that, they, that there's this vulnerability to failure, uh, increasing organizations, and the fact that practices don't get along with each other very well <laughs> often, and uh, that, that's a challenge. But, you know, there's also the, te the, the technical issue of, of, um, 
of proving that it works. Uh, most, a lot of people don't believe it will ever work. A lot of people also don't care whether it will work or not. Um, but uh, I do think uh, uh, advances in organ transplantation, uh, the, the possibility of, of uh, organ transplantation, and actually having human kidneys able to be transplanted and other organs uh, by, uh, after cryopreservation will certainly wake a lot of people up as to the possibility of, of cryonics working. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ben Best. Thank you, Ben, for an excellent presentation. That was an excellent job, I think, and I uh, appreciate the work that you put into this presentation. So we have a couple of short films coming up. The first is a film with Dr. Oz and Larry King. Larry King is a well-known proponent of uh, cryonics, and we're going to go ahead and run that film now. I want to again point out while we're bringing up this film that it was uh, life insurance uh, that most people... We've been talking a little bit go. about this idea you have of living forever. I'm going to define it for everybody, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. When I say living forever, this is not sci-fi anymore. Now there's the ability to do cryopreservation, to freeze your body as you die. So what is your hope? I, I'm, I'm, I was raised Jewish, but I lost my religion a long time ago. So I'm, I'm an agnostic atheist. I don't think you're going anywhere, all right? So I think when you die, that's it. And I don't want it to be it. <laughs> I want to be around. So I figure the only chance I have is to be frozen. And then, if they cure whatever I decide of, I come back. It's a thought. Oh, no, is, it, what, what, is it a better thought than being in the ground or well, being cremated? What, would you like to be educated a bit about what exactly happens when they freeze you? Yeah, I would like to know exactly what happens. Y'all want to know that a little bit? It's, come on over. So the reason I had a belt on was my mic pack, but there I am. Okay, so oh, here... that's all right. Looks okay. It's like this. Oh. oh, come over to this side. It's better. It's a better view for you. How do you know about everything? Uh, I study. I study. So hold your suspenders. You hold yourself up just in case. So this is what happens. Okay. So they just said you're gone. They throw you in ice as fast as they can. The cryopreservation starts immediately. They start pumping on your chest with this machine to circulate the blood. Then they can put a breathing bag to give oxygen to you at the same time. So now they're basically doing what they would do if you were still alive. The reason they do this is as everything's circulating through, they now have time to put a needle in your arm and give you a medical grade antifreeze. This cold solution is then pumped not just to your arm but in, into your chest, very low temperature until you ultimately get to a really, really cold place where there's no metabolism happening. The cells that are there are still alive and they're kept that way. Then they put you in this big casket, it's a freezer basically, they flip you upside down, they freeze your body, and they put you with three of your best friends because you're going to be stored in these containers for some time. And then ultimately, as you say, if there's a reason to unfreeze you, we figure out how to unfreeze you, then you're unfrozen, together with your three colleagues there. What about the story where they cut your head off? So you can I'm also not. just freeze your head. That's cheaper, by the way, if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. They, they cut your head off, and then they can put that fluid right into your head. Although, I got to say, I'd preserve the whole body. If you're going to do it, do it right. I'll do it right. I'd preserve the whole body. But then how do they know in... in in that tunnel there, that guy died of this. Well, they're going to have all the records. They've got to keep the record. But as a physician, the part that's intriguing is keeping enough of your cells alive that one day they could make a bionic version of you. That's sort of the hope, right? That's why they preserve just the head. They figure they'll get a different body. That body's done. They'll put a different head on a machine, and you'll have awareness. Now, my wife, whose picture you have up, I see there. Yes. Uh, she said to me, you come back in 200 years, you won't know anybody. So I said, I'll make new friends. <laughs> <laughs>we have another we film, have another a film, couple of couple more, two more short films, and then we'll be done for the evening. And these are tours of the Cryonics Institute, Institute and of Alcor. Alcor. So let's so go let's ahead and show those show films. Those films.
singularity. Hi guys, we are visiting the Cryonics Institute today near Detroit, Michigan. And the purpose of our visit would be to tour the facilities, to find out more about the process of cryopreservation, as well as the process of potentially becoming a member and joining the community at the Cryonics Institute. Hi Andy. Hi. Thanks for having us over today. I'm glad you could make it. We would uh, like to tour the facility if that's okay. And sure. if you would please uh, show us how the process works from the beginning to the end. I'll be happy to. Follow me. Thank you. So we are inside uh, the Cryonics Institute with Andy Zulaki, who has agreed to show us the facilities as well as teach us about the process of cryopreservation. From the beginning, right after the moment that legal death has been declared, until what we call uh, the patient being put in long-term storage. So Andy, tell us what happens right after, for example, I am legally pronounced to be dead. Once you're legally pronounced, the standby team would put you in a portable ice bath and the object is to cool you down as quickly as possible to above freezing temperature, probably about 15 degrees Celsius. And that's going to be accomplished by covering you completely with crushed ice and about halfway covered up with water because circulating water cools a lot faster than ice alone. There's a pump that goes in here to spray the water over top of the patient to accelerate the cooling. On this particular ice bath we have made by Michigan Instruments is called a thumper and that keeps your heart going and it keeps oxygen going into the lungs. We also have uh, for other standby kits we have what's called a Lucas, various types but they all do the same thing it's to keep the heart going using compression. It actually uses compression, it will push down and it will pull up so you've got better circulation that way. And they're going to be kept in here and uh, the heart will be maintained and the circulation of the water maintained until they're cooled down and at, during that time different medications will be administered. For example, you're going to use heparin to keep the blood from clotting. You'll use Maalox in a, in a combi tube into the stomach to keep the acids in the stomach from dissolving the lining of the stomach and different types of medications are used. And then the standby team, it, depending on the situation where you died, if they can do the surgical work on the spot or in their vehicle, they'll do it there. If not, they will go to a funeral home, use the facilities at a funeral home, and then they'll wash the blood out of the body. And they'll use a cold organ preservative solution when they're washing the blood out of the body, and that will further help to cool the body, and it will also help to keep the cells alive with the organ preservative solution. Once that's accomplished, they'll then pack you in regular water, ice, and either get you on an air, airplane and have you transported to the facility or by vehicle, whichever is quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the purpose of the mobile unit, which is basically to preserve you from the moment that you're legally declared to be dead until the moment that you arrive at the premises of the Cryonics Institute, right. where the actual process of vitrification can begin. Is that so? Correct. Okay. so. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the solutions that you use in order to uh, perfuse the body and prepare it for the vitrification process, as well as the machines that you use or the process that you use to get that done? Okay, sure. Well, this, this here is actually our perfusion pump and our perfusion system. It's a, it's a roller pump, a reservoir for the solutions, a filter. Filter can catch, will catch any small particles that might be in there, but it's primarily for air because you don't want any kind of air entering the, the person's circulatory system. There's also a pressure monitor, a digital pressure monitor, and the patient is cannulated, which is, we use uh, the surgical instruments. Actually, a funeral director does the surger, surgery and cannulates the patient, which is connecting the, the, the uh, perfusion pump to the arteries and open a, the vein, veins for drainage. And the type of solution we use, it's a it's combination of ethylene glycol and DMSO. It's, the solution was actually developed by a cryobiologist that worked for us at one point, And he also worked for the Immortalist Society. And 
It's done in various steps, different percentages, so that way we don't shock the system with too viscous of a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's stepped up and it comes, actually it's used out of the refrigerators. That's what you see the refrigerators for. Um, the lower percentages are refrigerated, but the higher percentages, when we get to the 70%, it actually comes out of the freezer. It's about minus 18 when it's being circulated into the body. And the perfusion, depending on the situation, in the case of the patient, can go anywhere from an hour and a half up to about three hours or so. And during that time, we monitor the effluents coming out of the patient. And that's when we, we use a refractometer. We measure the refractive index. When the refractive index matches the, reaches the same measurements of what's going in as what's coming out, it means that the body is saturated, the tissue is saturated, it can't take up anymore. And that's when we know when to quit. We also bur um, put burr holes in the skull to monitor for swelling. And you can also monitor visual, you know, the face for swelling. If we get any type of swelling, then we're going to stop because you don't want to have any kind of pressure put on the brain and swelling. So um, a patient that gets a good standby gets to us quickly. You usually don't have any kind of edema, no swelling at all. A patient that may not have had the best standby or might not have got a standby or possibly a sudden death, then you're going to be a lot more careful monitoring for swelling because they're going to, they're going to be more susceptible to the edema. Mm -hmm. So Andy, once the tissues have reached the required degree of uh, solution saturation, then what's the next step towards placing the body in long-term storage? The next step is to cool them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And how long does that process take? It takes about five and a half days. We have a computer controlled cooling unit to do it. If you want to come with me, I can show you. Oh, fantastic. Let's have a look. This is a computer controlled cooling unit. It's designed for one person. It operates, the cooling mechanism is using nitrogen gas, and it does require electricity to operate. We have backup batteries, so that way if we're ever doing a cool down, we get a power outage, storm or anything, the batteries will continue to operate to, to keep the unit running so there's no disruption in the cooling. It's a, very, it's a simple controller, thermocouple. The patient is placed inside, the thermocouples are placed inside to monitor the temperatures. Um, this big line you see here is connected to our liquid nitrogen bulk tank behind the building. It holds three gallons or 3,000 gallons of liquid nitrogen. It comes through here. Its solenoid valve is what controls the gas going in and out. We've got different programs for different circumstances, whether we get a person just vitrified here or uh, in Europe, for example. We'll choose the right program, program it, start it and it just operates on its own. It takes about five and a half days to cool a person down to vitrification temperature, or to vitrify them, cool them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And it's a matter of just, the program just opens and closes the valve as it needs to cool it. And how do you monitor, for example, the rate of cooling down between 110 pound woman and a 250 pound guy? Because so, I imagine that the rate of cooling of one body would be very different to the rate of cooling to another body. Is that correct? It, they cool, uh, it will take longer for a larger person to reach the liquid nitrogen temperature, but they're going to cool fairly at the same rate. Well, I should say the, we use the same program, it's just going to have to run longer is all. Mm -hmm. But we always run them for five and a half days at least. But if the person is larger, then we'll go six days or six and a half days if we have to. But do we you have, have a way of monitoring how that, that process of cooling is developing? We, we, watch, we monitor the temperature inside of the unit. We have laptop computers that actually chart the temperature as it goes down. Mm -hmm. And once they're, once they're down to the liquid nitrogen temperature, we'll hold them for an hour at, the, at that point. But if it's a bigger person, as I said, we'll, we can hold them longer. And what's the final temperature that you're going for in this unit? We want one, minus 196, but we get about minus 195 or so because the liquid nitrogen evaporates at that point, so we run them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. So Andy, let's say that the process of cooling down of the patient has already been completed. Then what's the next step towards long-term storage? Well, it'd be moving them just from the cooling chamber into one of the cryostats. 
we've got actually we've got several different generations of cryostats that we built. The first generation were cylinders, similar to the ones we're using now, but they're built a little differently and are also built for one. The first one was for one patient, second one was for two patients. As we got more and more patients, it just wasn't economical to build them. Then we decided to go to rectangulars, and this is the first rectangular model, and it actually does have wall-to-wall -wall support on the inside. Well, wall-to-wall -wall support can conduct heat, and it's not as efficient as if there was no support. So with that, we come up with the third generation, which is this one here that holds 14 patients. The one over there holds 10 patients. There is no wall-to-wall -wall support on the sides, only on the bottom for, for holding the weight. And heat can be con transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. So if you put if you remove the supports, you're not going to have any conduction through there, so it makes it more efficient. And a lot of insulation is going to take the distance away, which would reduce the radiation, and you pull a vacuum on it, and you don't have the convection. The, they're very efficient, but they're also very time-consuming to build and expensive because of all the heavy ribbing. So after that, they do take less floor space, but we decided that the expense of the rectangulars saving a smaller amount of floor space really wasn't worth it because we were putting the money back into the materials and time to build it. So we went to a fourth generation, which is similar to the first, but they're larger, and they're over here. So this is basically the fourth generation latest design unit for long-term storage. Correct. And as you can see, we've got about 16 of them here. We've got one in the back that we're going to be fireproofing, uh, painting them fireproof material on them. We just got that from the manufacturer, and we've got another one ordered that they're working on. So this, that's, this is the type that we're going to be sticking with. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the design of these units? Because to tell you the truth, I'm quite impressed that, you know, those are at what temperature inside? Minus 196 Celsius, which is about minus 320 Fahrenheit, so almost 400 degrees cold. Yeah, and I'm absolutely amazed that there's not even a condensation on the outside of the unit. Right. It's and a, it doesn't even feel cold to the touch. That's how well insulated it it's is. It's a very good insulator. It's perlite. Perlite is a mineral that gets baked. It expands. It pops similar to popcorn. Then it gets ground real fine. So it's a very, very fine powder inside of there. And then we pull a vacuum on it out of the insulation, remove all the air. So then you don't have the, um, the convection currents in there that would transfer heat from the outside to the inside. So you pull a vacuum on it, and you're increasing the efficiency by a factor of 10. So you get a good vacuum, you're going to use a tenth of the liquid nitrogen. These cylinders, their outside shell is 6 foot diameter, inside shell is 4 foot diameter. We, full, we hold six full body patients in each one. We only, actually, we only store full body patients. We only provide that service for full body suspensions. Each one holds six. Um, there is room in them near the top there where we can put pets, which helps us to store them m much more efficiently. At some point, um, we might devote one individual for pet storage, but we don't need to, and it's very economical to do it this way. Now, you said that each of those uh, containers actually has six patients. Correct. Are they heads up or heads down? They're all stored head down. The reason they're and stored head down, I'm sure you probably know, is, is so that if the last, it, that would be the last thing to ever be thought if there was an emergency. If for some reason we can't get liquid nitrogen supplies, which hasn't happened, but you never know. There could be civil unrest, there could be a war, there could be something, a ca catastrophe of some sort. So the last thing that we would want to be thought would, of course, be the brain. So they're all stored head down. So speaking of emergency, one of the most uh, commonly submitted audience questions is, what happens when you guys lose electricity? How do you sustain that very low temperature on the inside of the units? The temperature is sustained by liquid nitrogen, not by electricity. It's like if you have your freezer unplugs or goes out, then you have a problem. Not, not the case here. This is just by replenishing the liquid nitrogen as it boils off. I reload the liquid nitrogen in these about once a week. You can go a couple weeks without a problem, but we don't need to do that because we've got a good supply of it, and it's better to top it off regularly. If you, when I was testing these, I let them boil down completely empty, and they'll go six months before they actually empty out. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fantastic. So perhaps the, one of the last questions that I have for you today is pets. 
Can you tell us about pets and where and how you preserve them? Or if you have a specifically designed units for pets? Well, with pets, we actually we have some in here, the smaller pets. And these are actually the only commercial doors that we have. Um, they're placed in here. It's the larger pets are actually stored in with the people. Mm -hmm. How many pets uh, would you be able to store in a unit like this one? It would depend on the size. I mean, cats, you could probably fit, I would say, about a dozen cats in here. We don't have that many in here. We also have DNA samples and we because we store DNA samples for our members. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks very much for a fascinating tour, Andy. I would also like to ask you a few questions about the general mission of the Cryonics Institute, as well as the process by which new members may be allowed to join your community and take advantage of your facility and your services. So, who would be the best person to give me that information? Well, David Ettinger would be a good one to talk to about that. I can introduce you to him. Fantastic. Let's go talk to David then. Okay. That's the tour of the Cryonics Institute. Now we have a short film on the tour of Alcor. Hi, Max. Hi, hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. These are my friends, Rick and Tanya. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Very nice to meet you. How are you doing? So, let me show you around and explain our procedure from start to end. We can start actually with a mock-up of the early stages of the procedure. Cool. What happens when our patient's being declared clinically dead and we initially go into action and begin the cooling. All right, Max. Let's imagine that I have terminal cancer and my days are counted. I come to you and we have already done all the paperwork and signed the contract. What happens next? Well, if we have advanced warning, as we have in the majority of recent cases, We'll send a standby team out, which as the name implies, means they come and they stand by and wait until clinical death has been declared, which is of course not the same as biological death. It's essentially today's doctor saying, there's nothing much more I can do for this patient. Maybe I could actually revive them for a while, but they're just gonna die again. So at that point, um, the standby team goes into action. Suppose we're in a hospital or a hospice. As soon as clinical death has been declared, within seconds, we'll lift the patient, put them in an ice bath like this, Actually, in a remote location, it'd be a lighter version of this one. This is more for local cases. We'll cover the patient with ice externally to begin external cooling. We'll take over respiration. We'll restart circulation by essentially, it's just like doing CPR, except this device also has suction as well as pressure downwards. So we're restarting everything, essentially. And at the same time, we're administering a whole series of medications, 16 of them in all. The first one of which is propofol, because even though the person's been called dead, that doesn't mean they're not gonna wake up again. You know, because there's not some sharp line. People can come back from that. So the first thing we do is to ensure they don't regain consciousness temporarily, because you wouldn't want that during the procedure. Wow. Uh, we then administer antacids, um, things to raise uh, heat blood pressure maintained, uh, to reduce cellular metabolism, a whole range of different medicines essentially to reduce the problems that occur when the body stops functioning. Uh, what you don't see here is a device called a squid, because it looks kind of like a squid with long rubbery arms. That's spraying icy water around, so it's not just ice sitting on the patient, it's actually being circulated to accelerate the cooling. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, some of the procedures we do to initially begin the procedure. We, we don't want to take things below freezing at this point, we want to get down close to freezing as quickly as possible. Uh, we can also use a cooling mask which goes over the patient's head. It's very important obviously to cool the brain as quickly as possible. Uh, so apart from the circulating water, the cooling mask can also accelerate that procedure. So that's what we begin to do and then transport the patient from here. If it's a local case, we'll move this into our emergency vehicle, lock it down, drive it here, and then move on to the operating room. If it's a case in another state, uh, or in Canada for instance, we'll put them on a plane, either a commercial or a chartered one, depending on the individual, fly them here right to the airport, which is right next door to Alcor, and then bring them into the operating room. So having picked up the patient from the hospital or hospice, we transport the patient here and we're cooling as quickly as we can, at least until we get to just above the freezing point of water. We do not want to get any colder until we've done the surgical procedure. Now the patient may actually arrive still fairly warm, it's a local case. We've had, um, I think about 33 minutes is our quickest time from declaration of clinical death 
to arrival actually here at the building. So if that's the case, they're still cooling, and we want to get them down to probably around 20 degrees C before we begin surgery. If they've come from another state, they're going to be pretty close to the freezing point. So that's when we need to begin surgery. So then we'll take them over to the operating table. We have a number of surgeons on call, so we've already arranged for them to come over. The patient will then uh, be lifted. We actually have a lift to do that, a proper uh, pneumatic lift. They'll be moved here onto the operating table with the head at this end. And one of the first things we do is actually make a couple of burr holes in the skull to, uh, just like you do in brain surgery, essentially, to observe the brain, whether it's swelling or contracting. That tells us something about the circulation that we're getting. Uh, then depending whether it's a whole body patient or someone just preserving the brain only, if it's a whole body patient, we'll access the major blood vessels of the heart and connect those up to the heat exchanger and the perfusion machinery here. And the idea there is to wash out the blood and body fluids as quickly and thoroughly as possible and replace those with a cryoprotectant, which will be uh, in the reservoir here. And that starts off at a fairly low concentration because we don't want to chemically shock the cells and we gradually ramp that up in concentration over time. So it's, it's circulating and recirculating through the patient, gradually raising that concentration. The idea is to try and eliminate ice crystal formation. Ice crystals are the enemy of good biological sustainability. So actually what we will do in the end is vitrify the patient. The solution will get colder and colder, more and more viscous, and become really like a glass-like solid, holding everything in place. How long does the procedure take for this part of it? Oh goodness, that can vary. It really depends a lot on the condition of the patient. Some patients, uh, for instance, Fred Chamberlain, our co-founder, um, we cryopreserved him last year, Despite having you know, died of cancer and being in his 70s, his vascular system was in excellent condition. So that was relatively easy. We didn't have complications. Other people have very bad cardiovascular problems. We've had patients who, when we try to open their chests, everything just kind of tears because they've had, uh, you know, it's been sewn up and wired up and they've had things replaced. So it can be a real mess. Some people have aneurysms and then we may get some bleeding from the brain and that's a real problem. We've got to adjust the procedure. We may have to switch blood vessels. We may have to go from you know, cardiac to femoral or straight to the carotids, depending on the condition of the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So it can take an hour, it can take a lot longer, depending on the complications. I see. And what about those people who choose neuropreservation only rather than full body preservation? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Pretty strange option, you might think. Why preserve just the brain? But I'm one of those strange people. That's, that's my option. Even though I have sufficient funding to go whole body, I figure by the time I get to the age where I'm likely to need to be cryopreserved, this whole body is going to be in pretty bad shape. So why not protect the important stuff, which is all up here? So what we'll do in that case, it'll be initially the same procedure. The patient will be put on this operating table. Um, we'll probably be doing the burr holes to observe the surface of the brain. And then we will separate the, uh, the head from the rest of the body. Now we're interested in the brain, but try and remove the brain from the skull is just too difficult. Plus it provides additional mechanical protection. So there's no point trying to remove it, but it really is the brain we're interested in. We will then uh, move the patient's cephalon, as we call it, to the cephalon box here. And the head actually goes upside down and is secured with these clamps. Uh, and then as with the whole body patient, except this time we'll access the carotids and we'll use the perfusion machinery here, and again, the heat exchanger, the same thing, removing the fluids from the brain, the blood and body fluids as much as possible, gradually increasing the level of cryoprotectant, uh, which we'll be monitoring with our computerized system here, basically telling us what temperature, what pressure, uh, degree of concentration of the cryoprotectant. The cryoprotectant is really kind of a medical grade antifreeze, to put it sort of in simple terms. It uh, protects the body against ice crystal formation, uh, but it is itself somewhat toxic. Um, you know, there's no doubt our procedures do some additional chemical damage. So we try to minimize that by improving the formulation and by introducing it at the optimal speed, which we've learned through experience and experiment. So what is the next stop after you have stabilized or vitrified the patient, whether he's a neuro case or she's a neuro case or a full body preservation? What happens next? Well, what we need to do now is move the patient, whether it's a neuro patient or a whole body patient, into the patient care bay, where we continue the cool down as rapidly as possible till we get down to minus 110 degrees C. At that point, we're going to slow down the process. But that's really the next step is rapid cool down, either in the whole, down, uh, whole body cool down box or uh, for the neuro patient in a smaller dewer. Essentially, we'll be injecting liquid nitrogen, pumping it in at a measured rate to control that rate of descent. We need to optimize the rate of descent to minimize any fracturing damage. Let's go have a look. Okay, let's go this way.
but you can see some of our patients, these are ones who are publicly known. You can choose whether to be public or private. Uh, it's good to actually see some of the patients that we have who are cryopreserved. And this is James Bedford, the very first person to be cryopreserved back in 1967. So here is the patient care bay. This is where we keep all our patients. 117 of them right now. <laughs> Max, is this bulletproof glass? Yes, it's pretty bulletproof. Probably <laughs> won't stop a rocket launcher, but uh, anything short of that. In fact, the whole patient care bay is reinforced with metal plates and Kevlar, so someone could try and run a truck into the building and they wouldn't get very far. So this is the most secure area of the building. Uh, all the Jewers have alarms too. Uh, so in each one of these Jewers is four whole body patients and up to five neuro patients in the center column in the middle. And all 117 patients are in there waiting for as long as it takes, which will probably be a few decades. This is uh, one of the early Jewers that James Bedford, the first cryo patient, was stored in, uh, originally from 1967. We moved him out of here back in 1991 and uh, you can still see the original ice that was there, so we know he was never defrosted, which is good news. Mm -hmm. And he was then transferred into one of the modern upright style dewers you see there, which are much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So why do you take the extra effort to make this so bulletproof and kind of fortify the, the facility? Worst case scenario, we don't know, there might be crazy people out there who don't like what we do for whatever reason. We don't know what possible threats there would be, but we just try to reinforce against every conceivable eventuality that we can afford to protect against. Obviously there are some kinds of attacks that if they're very well organized with lots of equipment and financing, they could destroy us and we couldn't stop them. But for a casual person going doing a drive-by, uh, the windows on the conference room and the rest of the building uh, have shutterproof glass. Uh, we have high security locks being put in right now. And this is obviously the most secure area we want to protect against any kind of attack if we can. You can't stop a determined attacker, but you can slow them down and give the police time to arrive. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see inside? Let's go have a look. I'm dying to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Did I just say I'm dying to see this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you did. You, only, you don't have to clinically die to see this. Not truly biologically dead, fortunately. So there's all the operating procedures are being done, and we finished the the uh, intermediate cool down. The patient will be in a sleeping bag to protect the skin. And then if you want to demonstrate, we're stepping into the pod. These were aluminum pods. We would then strap the patient in, uh, bolt this close, that provides additional protection so the patient isn't damaged. And then this pod will be lifted up through the skylight and then down into these dewers. And as you can see, four of these will fit inside one of these dewers with additional space for neuro patients in the center. What about the people who are just neuropreservation? How do you store them? Okay, we can get about 10 neuro patients in the same volume, but we have slightly different pod systems, as you can see. So, the same size as a whole body pod, but here is room for 10 whole body, uh, 10 neuro patients. And this is placed over the head, again for mechanical protection, just in case there's any external shock. <laughs> Most people's heads will fit in there. We've had one that was a pretty tight fit, but... Uh, we know mine fits. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I only care about mine. <laughs> and, uh, the patient, the skull, will actually have temperature probes attached as we're doing the long-term cool-down. So, where are the... They'll be in the, they'll, they'll, you know, the skull will be protected by some material that will be placed over the top. Um, and then put in one of these, which goes inside the, the big duo. So, how many people do you have all together? We currently have 117 patients, averaging about 8 per year, but varies between about 3 and 11, depending on how busy the year is. Mm -hmm. And the electric bill for this facility must be ginormous in the middle of Arizona's desert. Well, for the offices, yes, but these actually don't use any electricity. The alarm systems use electricity, but we don't need those to maintain the temperature. We just top up with liquid nitrogen. And as you can see, this is room temperature on the outside. It's like a gigantic thermos bottle. Yeah. We just fill these up every week or so. We can actually leave them for six months or so before they would reach a low level. Uh, but no electricity is required to maintain the temperature. It just boils off at minus one ninety six degrees C. That's absolutely fantastic. And what's the difference between the shiny ones and the kind of older looking ones? Yeah, well, these are older ones. Uh, over time, we've just upgraded them. We've stretched them taller. They're just more energy efficient that way. Mm -hmm. 
because there's a little more room to work. Otherwise, they're essentially the same engineering design. So I imagine better insulation and everything. Yeah, this is an art to making these. We give bonuses to the engineers who fabricate them because it really takes quite a bit of skill to produce these and minimize the boil-off rates. The best ones of these boil off about uh, eight liters a day. The worst ones about 17 liters a day. Mm -hmm. And what's the gauge here measuring? This tells us how much liquid nitrogen there is in one of these. We keep them full. Um, although we top them off every week, we did a test. I think actually one of these lasted about eight months until the liquid nitrogen got low down. Uh, even when there's just a little bit at the bottom, because of the aluminum pods we saw that go through the whole length of these things, the temperature is conducted and circulates. So even with a few inches of liquid nitrogen after many months of boil off, uh, at the top it's still going to be within a few degrees of the temperature at the bottom. So if there's some huge disaster and disruption in supply, we'd be good for many months. And at that time we could buy a liquid nitrogen plant. That's absolutely amazing. So you're telling me these things can survive on their own for six or eight months without any damage or change of temperature inside of them? That's right. And without direct connection to the external world? That's right. That's fantastic. So I guess it's a good long time if we have to go out and buy a you know, portable liquid nitrogen plant. It costs about twice as much to produce the liquid nitrogen, but we could do that. And what's that short, small little one here that's all locked up? This is exclusively for neuro patients. So although we have neuro patients and some of the larger ones too, this is obviously just for neuro patients. So what you're saying is that I could wait for the singularity <laughs> like this? You could indeed. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I have a few more serious questions for you. Can we go somewhere and talk a little bit? Let's go to the conference room. Fantastic, let's go. So now you've had the chance to learn a little bit about what cryonics is, what cryonic suspension is, how it works with the Dr. Oz video, with the presentation, the wonderful presentation from Ben Best. He's given you the history and the information on Bedford, James Bedford, the first man who's been preserved and is currently preserved. You have the tours of Cryonics Institute and Alcor, the two foremost cryonic organizations in the world. And I suspect you may have questions, and I'd like to point out that just outside these doors and downstairs we have a couple of tables. On those tables there's information about cryonics, you can get applications for the leading organizations, and you have Rudy and Ben, myself, and others to talk to if you have any questions about cryonics. So I want to thank you for coming, and I would like to remind you that later this month, on January 23rd, Thursday evening, we have Liz Parrish coming. It's going to be a great presentation. And I'd like to reiterate the fact that we are, first and foremost, immortalists. We wish to reverse aging, and we look at cryonics as a plan B, as for myself, as a life insurance policy. If something should happen to me before I, we, we've established age reversal, then this is something that I would uh, take part in and with the anticipation, with the hopes, with the desires of coming back at a later date. So I wish you all a very happy Bedford Day and look forward to talking with you downstairs where we can share some of the food that has been brought by many of our members here in our Potluck Social. Thank you.